toutes les conférences n'ont pas la chance d'avoir ce qu'on appelle des vedettes américaines, et bien nous, on a la chance d'en avoir trois des vedettes américaines. Please welcome Karen Sandler, John Sullivan et Keith Bergelt. Et please join me on the stage. Je bascule en anglais parce que c'est nos vedettes américaines, on les applaudit. Karen, welcome. Please have a seat. Have a microphone, <laughs> so you don't have to to fight to get uh, to to be able to so, so people can hear you. Everybody can hear you, and uh, maybe we can start by an introduction. Maybe we can start with you, Karen. You're the the woman in here, and uh, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Karen Sandler. I am the executive director of the Software Freedom Conservancy. Do you want to? Yes. Maybe can you can explain what exactly what you you're doing in. Uh sure. Uh, so um, I became interested in well, I became interested in free and open source software because we are all interested in free and open source software. Um, but uh, I'm particularly interested because I'm a cyborg. I oh, have really, <laughs> really <laughs> I have a, a heart condition, which means I'm at a very high risk of suddenly dying. So I have a defibrillator that protects me, and I cannot see the source code that is in my own body. So it turned me from being someone who thought that open source was cool and useful into someone who started thinking about the societal aspects of software and understand that free and open source software is essential for us to have safe and, safe and ethical technology overall. The software in my body is a metaphor for all of the software that we rely on. Great. Maybe you can start with John. John, can you introduce yourself? You know the cyborg, how are you? <laughs> no, I, I'm not. Uh, uh, my name is John Sullivan. I'm the executive director at the Free Software Foundation. Uh, I've actually worked at the FSF since 2003, uh, so 13, 13 and a half years now. Uh, I've been the executive director just for the last five, and um, during that time, we've seen the, the FSF grow uh, about 50% larger staff-wise than we were uh, when I first started as executive director. We just had our 31st anniversary in October. So it's very interesting to me to think about the fact that a lot of people uh, at you know, conferences like this have, have never known a world without the FSF existing and without free software existing. Um, and I think everybody at the organization takes that responsibility very seriously and we work very hard on a daily basis to get, uh, to make sure that people here uh, about the values associated with free software and it's important for a fundamentally um, free and democratic society. And personally, I came to free software not from a technology side. Um, my background is in uh, creative writing and the humanities. Oh, really? So, so we have a, a, a cyborg and a humanist. Yeah. <laughs> no programmers so far. Though, so <laughs> I think we've both well, uh, done a little. We both have programming. programming. <laughs> but, but, um, uh, I think we're, we're both coming to this from a standpoint of, of really seeing the importance of free software for people, whether they develop software or not. So it's not just about being able to modify code, but the culture that's created, uh, the kind of software that's created in a culture where programmers can freely modify and share each other's code. Everybody mm -hmm. benefits from that. Okay, great. Keith, uh, what about you? Uh, Keith Bergelt, I'm the CEO of Open Invention Network, which is a... Uh, an 11 year old entity that uh, that came into being and it's appropriate that I go after John because uh, I kind of review what OIN is is uh, is, a, is a patent protection zone a patent non aggression uh, community development activity which is designed to create a culture much like uh, Richard Stallman 31 years ago created a culture around how we utilize uh, make the appropriate use of, of copyrights and mm -hmm. look for attribution and not uh, not personal gain from our copyrights and encourage more utilization. 
uh, Open Invention Network came into being to develop a code of conduct uh, through its license uh, that uh, embraces the notion of, of uh, open and collaborative development of technology that supports a modality for, uh, for developing new innovation in society where one plus one plus one doesn't equal three, but it equals six or 10 or 20 when we bring smart people around the a, a, a problem uh, that we're attempting to solve or address uh, in code. And so OIN has quietly become the largest patent on aggression community in the history of technology designed to support patent on aggression and freedom of action in open source. Mm. Okay, so you, you heard uh, right just before your intervention that, that Linux, open source is everywhere now, in routers and uh, internet of uh, things. Uh, now we have uh, open source software uh, everywhere. Um, we just mentioned before that um, uh, there's a connection between open innovation and open source. That's what we're saying here in France. I want to have your perspective from uh, the other side of the Atlantic. Maybe we can start with you, John. So we have, let, let me reflect, we have Karen. Karen's our cyborg. Karen is, uh, <laughs> is managing uh, open source projects to make them grow. And um, John, who is on F FSF, so he's the humanist. And Keith, who's um, looking at the copyrights, how to protect intellectual property and things like that. And you help people fight, you, you're going to explain. So John, from your perspective, um, how do you see the links between uh, the, the connection between uh, open innovation and open source, innovation and open source? Uh, so the Free Software Foundation, are, we are based in the United States, but uh, we view our work as being worldwide. Uh, and I'm sorry for my French, but uh, that's something we have, about half of our membership is actually outside of the United States. Uh, and the GNU project, which we support, and the GNU General Public License, which has been the basis for uh, much of what we're talking about here today, are, are both international uh, projects and have international applicability. But um, certainly my personal familiarity is, is, has, uh, is more with the United States than uh, what's going on in other places, but we do uh, try to expand that vision globally. And I think when we're talking about innovation, uh, an important thing to start with is what we mean by innovation. You know, innovation is uh, progress, creativity towards some end. But when I think, especially in the business world, we talk about innovation, we often assume we're talking about things like new features, new capabilities of software. Um, but in the free software world, when we're talking about innovation, you know, we say that free software achieves those things, new features, technologies better than other models of development because programmers are able to build freely on everything that came before them and they can borrow from each other and learn from each other and uh, stand on each other's shoulders. And that certainly does, uh, history proves, lead to uh, technical innovation. But also, a lot of times in free software, we spend time going back and doing things that have already been done in the proprietary world. Uh, for example, we're still working on uh, getting a, a best-in-class free software uh, video peer-to-peer -peer communication system uh, working. And we, there, you could say that that innovation's already happened because we have Skype but that's proprietary software. And so in free software, when we talk about innovation, we also mean innovation in terms of values. You know, how can we get this technology without sacrificing user freedom? We can't deny that proprietary software companies also invent things sometimes, and they innovate. Uh, but that's not the kind of innovation that we want. We want uh, innovation that is not only technically awesome, but also respects its users. And so when we're talking about uh, getting businesses and communities together, uh, I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind. We need to be um, supporting those companies which are innovating in the right way, not just taking the free software model and using that for, to produce software which they'll then uh, distribute as partly proprietary or, or all proprietary. So when we talk about innovation, let's remember the values that we're innovating toward, not just the technology. And does, does any, everybody agree with what was being said, Karen? I, I, I agree, but I wanted to, to add an example. Uh, so very recently I was pregnant, and uh, being a cyborg and having a defibrillator, uh, <laughs> uh, I was shocked twice during my pregnancy wow. because my heart did something that normal pregnant women's heart do. Well, pregnant women's hearts beat a little bit faster sometimes. They palpitate a little bit. And I see some people nodding in the audience who either 
uh, who have children, probably, uh, or, or, or doctors. <laughs> or, or the cyborg also. Or other cyborgs. <laughs> so we should meet afterwards. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, uh, but, but what I realized is that I just wasn't the target audience for my defibrillator. The number of women who mm. had my heart condition, who were pregnant, who had my defibrillator, was relatively small compared to the set of people who were the ordinary recipients of a defibrillator. And so it was a very easy example of where a company's fabulous innovation that I was thrilled to take part of, I'm so grateful to have my defibrillator and not have to worry about suddenly dying. But at the same time, I was out of options. I couldn't, mm -hmm. if I had all the money in the world, hire medical care to uh, alter my defibrillator. And so there's this balance between the, uh, you know, uh, the idea of being locked into a single vendor sounds very theoretical, but in actuality, it is very real. And, um, and, and, and further, is something that businesses have to worry about as well. Because, uh, because at the end of the day, you might, you might have needs that, uh, that your vendors are not anticipating. And, so, and, it's, and it's perfectly reasonable because I assure you that my medical device company does not want pregnant women to be shocked. That is mm. the last thing they want. But at the same time, it just simply wasn't a focus for the software. So we at Conservancy are focused on creating alternatives, um, just as, as John was saying, the GNU project is as well, um, creating, uh, supporting our projects. And our projects, we are based in the United States, but at this point, uh, I, I don't think that anyone can do it alone. So uh, practically every free software project is global in scale. And so this is something that we do together. Hmm. Uh, Keith, we didn't hear you about the, this uh, connection about between open source and open innovation, especially when you're um, you're a specialist in uh, patents and uh, things like that, and protection from the people from uh, people who are doing open source project. You're part of um, your m one of your mission is to protect them. Um, what's your take on that idea that open inno open source uh, op innovation uh, triggers open source or open source triggers innovation? I think, you know, the John's concept, when John's talking about freedom, to me, a lot of what I think about every day is how do we create more freedom of action, freedom of choice, the choice that Karen's talking about to engage with a device, to be able to kind of enhance it and to be able to understand it's the, the fact that there's code in that device and some of that code that comes from a proprietary place may not be as as upgradable, as vital, as useful as as code that we might be able to uh, to actually have through an upgrade process. And I think we look at all of the industries. It's when OIN started 11 years ago. Uh, essentially, open source and Linux were were largely tied to the enterprise. We've seen a migration to the Android, which is a, a Linux a Linux based device, runs on a Linux kernel, is built on a Linux kernel. And now we see the auto sector moving in that direction uh, with automotive grade Linux and Toyota becoming front and center to be able to drive that along with Daimler and another of other companies. They recognize that this notion of co-opetition is central to their future. It was a notion that was talked about, uh, much talked about in the early 90s, the idea that we need to collaborate to compete more effectively. I think that notion is so well established within the fabric of collaborative invention uh, that's part and parcel of what the fr free and open source software is about. The idea that people can come together, as John talked about, build on each other, stand on each other's shoulders, and create new novelty, create things that were otherwise not possible. So I think we develop pathways to innovation, what I called in the, my first comments a modality. That modality is what we're looking to guard and protect more than anything else. That what happens with that modality, how people interact, how people build on each other's ideas, is about kind of the natural organic development designed to, to solve bigger and more, more, more important problems. Uh, Karen, you want to react to that? Uh, I mean, I, I agree with Keith, but I think, that, um, I think that in some ways, I think industry hasn't embraced the collaboration fully. So I think we can say that free and open source software is in everything, but if we're honest, we have less freedom than we ever did before, right? Everything is being wrapped in a proprietary layer. And I think that companies are keen on collaborating together and innovating, but only to a certain point. And I think that that has been to the detriment of collaboration. And I think that if industry embraced, for example, copyleft a little bit more strongly, and Conservancy has projects that are permissively licensed, 
Um, and we have projects that are also copyleft licensed. So we have, we have both. But I would say that I think that if industry embraced sharing uh, a, a little bit more and a little bit more thoroughly up and down the stack, we would see an intense amount of new innovation that we haven't seen before. And I think we've, we've been, unfortunately, somewhat limited as companies sort of try to carve out more of their special sauce when they don't necessarily need to to forward their ultimate business model. Maybe the question is, and uh, you, you will react, Keith. Uh, maybe the question is, um, we usually uh, intellectual property uh, was invented to maybe to um, encourage innovation. And so is it encouraging uh, intellectual, pro intellectual property? Is it encouraging or in innovation or is it hampering innovation, Keith? I think where companies are coming from, we're doing pretty well, Karen. I, I admit that we could do better. But companies are coming from a world where it's a one or a zero, where you're either protected uh, and they, they have tens of thousands. Some of the companies that are active have 50 or 60,000 patents that are active in open source. And I think that's a great step forward. I do believe, as Karen's suggesting, that we could have more, and it's kind of John's idea about how we invent and, and how we, what, what kind of values we embody when we invent and collaborate together so that we recognize that, that it's about the, the ultimate, solving the ultimate problems. Uh, it's not just about our, our own positioning. But the reality is that it's, it's open and closed. Hmm. That's the world that we live in now, where people are making decisions about where they invent, where they file patents, where they differentiate. And their differentiation is, is fortunately much higher in the stack than it was before. So that it's not creating subluxations or bottlenecks low in the stack where we are ultimately collaborating, uh, be it on the kernel or, or on libraries, development of libraries, or, or lower, the lower stack parts of middleware. So I think we are, it's part of an evolution. Uh, and sometimes we get stuck and we're not as, a, as aggressive in, in collaborating in the way that we probably should. But I see tremendous improvement from where we came from uh, when Richard first started talking about FOSS, you know, 35 years ago. John, you wanted to add something? Uh, so I, I think uh, a couple of points about um, making sure companies are, are moving in the right direction and continuing to make progress, certainly, because certainly, you know, we're they made big leaps. You know, all the, the usage of, of free software and, and modern products is uh, something that, that wasn't happening previously. But I think copyleft is a really important thing that we need to keep stressing. Um, when a company uh, or anybody distributes free software under a permissive license, that's still free software as long as they're supplying the source code that goes with it. Um, but it's a kind of free software that can sort of be taken out of the of the commons. You know, it, it doesn't have to stay free in the future. What was already released will still be available for people to build on. But for example, Android, uh, Google in the past did decide for a while not to release the source code for a current version of Android. Um, and it wasn't released for several months. And that can happen when the software is not uh, copyleft. You know, mm -hmm. it's, we, if we're going to truly have innovation based on a free software model, it needs to come from an expanding pool of software that anybody can build on, and permissively licensed software contributes to that, but in a kind of a, a weaker way, a less permanent way. It's still something that we encourage companies to do, but we really hope that everyone who starts with that will take the next step uh, and more fully uh, join the movement and the effort. And at the FSF, we really want to recognize companies that uh, do keep values of user freedom at the top of their priority list. We have a certification program called Respects Your Freedom uh, fsf.org slash ryf, and, and that's one way that we try to help companies kind of compete, differentiate themselves based on their positive treatment of users. You know, they release all their source code uh, for the devices that they sell. They don't distribute any proprietary software with it, no proprietary requirements going along with those products. We've certified about 19 products so far from companies in the UK, Romania, and the US, and have a lot more to come. And I think as a community and on the nonprofit side, that's one thing we can do to help uh, companies see the benefits of fully participating in free software collaboration rather than just doing, uh, kind of dabbling in it or, or doing partly free and partly non-free. So. Karen, you want to add something? Because uh, also, uh, I'd like to, to add something. The, the, um, uh, does Wall Street uh, value open source? I know uh, Wall Street value patents, 
but the problem of when you have a Wall Street valuing uh, the, the, the patents, uh, how can you also do the open source thing? Maybe you're going to add something, uh, Karen? Uh, yeah, I, on the previous point, I just wanted to add that uh, at Conservancy, one of the things that we, one of the programs we host is that for uh, Linux kernel developers and some other projects uh, like Debian, we, um, we host a GPL compliance project where we help, uh, we help developers enforce their license to make sure that companies are following it. And so uh, we, we, there are two sides to that. One is that we see really cool stuff. Right? When people give us uh, reports that a company is not in compliance, it's usually because the person who's sending the report is trying to do something awesome with the product, <laughs> uh, trying to, you know, to, to hack something cool together, whether it's a baby monitor or a car or something in their life, and they can't do it even though the license encouraged them to do it, which is unfortunate for a whole host of reasons, including the fact that when uh, customers are allowed, consumers are allowed to, uh, to, to do such things, it brings a whole new life to the products that are already there, brings improvements back to those products, but also brings uses that the manufacturer may not have even considered. So that's, that's really e exciting stuff. And on the flip side, we understand that companies might be a little bit reticent if they're worried that someone's going to hold their feet to the fire about the licenses. And so uh, we, along with the FSF, uh, published uh, principles of GPL enforcement, but basically, assuring that, uh, that lawsuits are a last resort and to take mm. litigation risk out of the room um, so that we can help companies understand how to learn about compliance and how to learn about copyleft in a safer way. So there are sort of those, those two aspects of it. Um, and I, then you asked another question. And I'm yeah, I, I, was, I was asking uh, that Wall Street values patent and is not valuing uh, open source. So that, that might be a problem sometimes. Yes, and oh, Kate, do you want to? It values open source, I think, and it, <clears throat> you look at a company like Red Hat, which is one of the only true pure plays. Yeah. That's a pure open source company. Uh, it gets, it trades very high volumes on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. It's had, I think, 56. But isn't that the exception that confirms the rule? Uh, no, well, it's just that there aren't many pure play public companies, but the... They were, the, but they, most of them disappear. Uh, I think some of them came out early, and, they, and the market probably wasn't ready for them. Uh, but I think that's a good point. You know, 15 years ago, there were a bunch of companies that came out, or a handful that came out. But I think, uh, you know, there are, there are uh, a variety of companies like Docker, for example. Yeah. Docker has a very high valuation. I think Docker Unicorn. It's a unicorn. Yeah, today. Docker's one of the most, probably one of the, the most significant innovations in the last few years. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, it's got, it's spawned other kind of iterations with Kubernetes and, and the whole notion of storage in the cloud and containers, I think, is something that, that has been, been, you know, captured the imagination of Wall Bitcoin Street. Bitcoin also, maybe? Yeah, I mean, blockchain technology. I think uh, Bitcoin's probably not the, yeah, the way we should have led with, but, but but blockchain and what Hyperledger, the Hyperledger project and other projects that are focusing on, focusing on that technology, I think it's going to transform transactions, microtransactions at banks. It'll change contract law to some degree because of the, 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 uh, the ledgering process that's involved. And so I think these are all areas that are ripe for more public offerings and for more acquisitions. Mm -hmm. So there's been a significant number of acquisitions where real value has been paid for open source centric companies without patents. I'm coming back to it, Karen, but I just wanted to ask, uh, this session is very interactive. I'm receiving many questions already, but keep on sending questions to our host and uh, they will answer them. Karen? Wall Street is looking at all of this very, very closely, um, and they are looking at ways to become contributors and to become more involved with free and open source software generally. For example, uh, Conservancy runs an internship program called Outreachy, uh, which globally is for women uh, to have internships in free and open source software. Within the US, we've expanded to people of color as well. Um, and um, for example, Bloomberg and Goldman Sachs have both sponsored that program. Mm. Um, so they're, they're looking for, for real ways to give back, understanding that they rely on this software and couldn't, uh, couldn't undertake their business in the way they do today without it. John, um, what's for you the biggest challenge facing open source, free open source software? Free open source software. Uh, well, I, th I think we have a, a lot of challenges, but I think one of them ties directly into to this point, which is if we want the the investors, and if we want the market to value uh, free software and free software companies more, then uh, we need to work on the, the demand side too and enable 
uh, consumers, the general public, to care about whether something that they buy is free software, has free software or not. You know, right now, uh, that's not happening. It's, it's really challenging to figure out if, if a particular product comes with all free software or has a mix of proprietary and free software. And, and right now, the general public understanding of this is based on uh, mostly uh, large corporate marketing budgets from, you know, Google with the Android side being perceived, you know, rightly so, as the more uh, freedom-friendly uh, option in the mobile space, and Apple, you know, on the other side being rightly perceived as the most restrictive. Mm. Um, but the truth in both cases is a lot more complicated than that. The iPhone uh, does use some free software underneath Android. Every Android device that's sold um, by, uh, in, in retail stores comes with proprietary software on it. Mm. So I think a major challenge we have as we want uh, companies who are doing free software to be valued accordingly and as a social justice movement we want everybody to have their freedom enabled by technology instead of to be controlled by technology um, to both of those ends have an overlapping solution which is we have to inform people and raise awareness about what free software is and then once people understand we have to give them a mechanism by which they can act on that mm. and we really don't have that no. right now and you know our certification program our label is one aspect, um, some of the things that I saw uh, last night at the award ceremony uh, were along these lines too of recognizing people who are taking steps, you know, administrations, uh, companies that are doing great things. And we need a lot more of that um, because our, our big challenge is to have the entire world care about free software, whether they write software or not. And mm -hmm. that's, uh, if we want the free software movement to be a global movement for everybody, we have to do a much better job at communicating with everybody. Maybe a question for all, for all of you. Um, what's your opinion on France, on, on France, and uh, uh, how do you see Europe on those issues and uh, open source innovation? Uh, maybe someone wanted to start. Keith. You know, I think the French government has made uh, efforts uh, in a variety of, of ways through academics, supporting academia, supporting research. Uh, the software heritage program that Roberta will talk about later today is I think an interesting step forward to give kind of a national identity around kind of creating a norm a normative version of uh, basically an aggregator aggregation of code so that everybody understands the code that's out there since it's dispersed right now in a variety of environments I think there are you know what's happening in Sophie Antipolis there there's software development there's some Amadeus is a very interesting software company comes out of the proprietary world, which is using an increasing amount of open source software now, um, which is basically runs 60% of, of all searches for, for airlines and hotels mm -hmm. in Europe. Uh, so I think there are, there are examples where the, the S SNCF and, and other, the railway systems are more part of a global, or, or sorry, a regional uh, pan-European uh, program now designed to incorporate more open source into uh, the, the rail systems to be able to manage them more efficiently, to be able to upgrade them and make the rail systems more safe mm. across, uh, across government uh, or across national boundaries. I think these are all examples of steps that we see that are, that are happening across Europe and in France in particular, designed to kind of create an identity and to be able to move forward. You know, I talk to companies in Germany and they say, well, if SAP is going to do something, then we'd be interested in, you know, like OIN, for example, and having a relationship. And SAP is one of our, our, our participants in our community. But SAP comes to a proprietary world mm -hmm. and is really learning and transitioning. And I, that's what we see in Europe is companies, like, whether it's Bosch or whether it's Siemens or, or, the, or Alcatel, they're all transitioning to open source platforms. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they're doing so because it's an in, there's an inevitability mm. about collaborative development that you can't avoid. Very few companies can survive in the future unless they participate with others in this notion of collaborative development and innovation. There was a question before uh, for you, Keith, and uh, w what enterprise, what companies uh, are not uh, that are not joined uh, OIN? And that you want them to join to, to 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 come to you. Well, we'd like all of the auto companies here in France. Give, give to us join. some some names. We uh, want some names. We'd like Alcatel to join, and Intel, and uh, and uh, uh, Siemens, and uh, any and French company. And Bosch, <laughs> sure. You know, the Alcatel, uh, and we we'd love the SNCF, and we'd love the, all the all the French banks to become participants because the to the banking community, to John's point, Karen's point, to the banking community, open source is becoming increasingly relevant. 
because they're changing the way that they clear, the way that they, 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 they provision services, the way they manage services for their clients, and the way, service, the way customers actually interact with the bank is largely going to be enabled by, by open source. Mm. Maybe K Karen, uh, your insight on Europe, France, and uh, innovation open source? Uh, I would word. say that a, a very a, a, a disproportionately high percentage of the key contributors to Conservancy's projects, and Conservancy has 40 projects, uh, Git, Samba Wine, Inkscape, QEMU, uh, uh, Boost, we've got uh, tons and tons of projects, and I would say a very disproportionate number of, of contributors, of the core contributors, are from France. I think that uh, that France has had a tradition of understanding the, uh, the ideals behind free and open source software, and um, especially coming out of academia, have really embraced it and become such a global influence. And so I've been extremely impressed with both the, the contributions that we've received and also the local organization here in France. I've been very impressed with April and the French organizations. I, I, I think that this is leading to a massive global impact in the long run. John? Yeah, I'm, I'm very jealous of uh, what's happened here, what happens here in France. And we see a similarly high level of contributors to the GNU project based in France. Um, it's one of the reasons we're, we're, we're always working at getting our materials translated into as many languages as possible. But our, our monthly newsletter we do in Spanish and French uh, for that reason. So I think a, one international thing uh, that we're focused on lately is trade agreements. Um, stopping agreements like the uh, TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, uh, but there will be others in the future which are trying to export the United States. Uh, bad laws from the United States are overzealous copyright system, our uh, patent system which allows uh, wrongly software to be patented, uh, our rules about uh, DRM, digital restrictions management, seeing that we don't want to see those laws exported anywhere else around the world. So I hope that uh, everyone in their respective countries will help work against the spread of those agreements when they include provisions like that. Thank you very much, Karen, Sandler, John Sullivan, and Keith Bergelt. You're from OIN, FSF, and uh, what's the name of the, the, the software? software. <laughs> Thank you very much. We can please applaud. Thank you for your insight.